In 1974, Turkey invaded the island of Cyprus and expelled its entire indigenous Greek population from the entire northern half of the island, despite the Greeks having lived there since the beginning of time. And in their place, the Turkish colonial authorities allowed around 200,000 Turkish colonists from mainland Turkey to occupy the houses of the now expelled native Christian population. And all these terrible crimes happened under the watchful eye of Britain, a state who until today has a military presence on the island. But despite this horrific atrocity being condemned by the United Nations as a form of colonialism, a war crime, and an illegal change of Cyprus's demographic structure, something many other people would describe as a genocide, and not to mention also an illegal armed occupation of European Union territory, no one is talking about this ongoing and very recent colonization of indigenous land by Turkey, a foreign, racist, and imperialist power. But why has the world forgotten about the colonization of Cyprus and the expulsion of its native Greek population when everybody loves to post TikToks about the plight of the Uyghurs in China and the Israel-Palestine conflict? And what did Turkey even want with this ancient Greek island in the first place? Well, to understand these pressing contemporary questions, we must first understand the conflict's historical background since this is where we will find most of our answers, starting with Cyprus's early history, and this will also underline just exactly how Greek this island is. The island of Cyprus is located in the eastern Mediterranean, very close to Anatolia, in other words, modern-day Turkey, and is also very close to the Levant, meaning Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. The island that is today the third most populous island of the Mediterranean was first settled by the Greeks during the Late Bronze Age, around 1,400 years BC, who then likely assimilated the already existing population into their own Hellenic culture. During the next century, Cyprus and its population became such an integral part of the ancient Greek cultural sphere and mythos that it was chosen as the birthplace of the Greek goddess of love Aphrodite and her lover Adonis, among many, many more mythical figures. The reason why Cyprus held such an important place within Greek culture is likely because of the island's large size and strategic position. But these facts would not only be a blessing, but also a curse because its strategic value also resulted in the island being conquered by many different empires. First by the Assyrians, then by the Egyptians, and then by the Persians. But despite being under foreign rule, the island's inhabitants remained staunchly Greek and largely uncolonized until the modern Turkish invasion more than 2,000 years later. But this native presence on Cyprus was about to be interrupted by a foreign colonial power that, unlike its former colonial rulers, would heavily discriminate against Cyprus's Greek population, the Turkish Ottoman Empire. But who were the Ottomans? The Ottoman Empire is the precursor to the modern nation-state of Turkey, but it might also surprise you if I told you that the Ottoman Empire, and therefore also Turkey, in fact has its origins in Central Asia, and this is why. During the 10th century, the Greek Byzantine Empire that controlled much of the Greek-speaking world, including Cyprus, was in steady decline, and this situation did not go unnoticed by the Muslim Turkish tribes who were migrating all the way from modern-day Turkmenistan to the Middle East in search of new lands to raid and colonize. The Turkic tribes, also known as the Turks, under the leadership of the Seljuk dynasty, therefore seized the moment and invaded the corrupt Byzantine state. The invasion only proved a limited Turkish success, but opened up parts of Anatolia to Turkish colonists who quickly started enslaving the native Christian Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks. The Turkic tribes slowly continued their conquest of Greek territory whose native Greek inhabitants were oppressed by their new foreign Muslim rulers via the discriminatory Islamic Dimi system. The Islamic Dimi system forced Christians to pay higher taxes and disallowed Christians from riding on horseback and live in houses that overlook those of Muslims, among many more things. These horrific practices compelled many poor Greeks to therefore convert to Islam and assimilate into Turkish culture. After having taken most of Anatolia, the Turkic tribes slowly consolidated themselves under the banner of the Ottoman Empire, who in 1453 finally conquered and looted the crown jewel of the Greeks and Orthodox Christianity, the city of Constantinopolis, who is today known as Istanbul, but not before its ruler, the last emperor of the Byzantine Empire, Constantine XI, did a hopeless final charge after stating, the city has fallen and I am still alive. 
After having now finished off its arch nemesis, the Greek Byzantine Empire, the Turkish Ottoman Empire now started turning its focus towards the few nearby areas that had somehow managed to escape its clutches, and that included Cyprus. But wait, where was Cyprus during all of this? Well, in 1453, at the time of the Greek Byzantine Empire's collapse, Cyprus had already been under Western Catholic rule for 200 years since it had been conquered from a rogue Byzantine aristocrat in 1191 by King Richard I of England, who then established the Kingdom of Cyprus. The new kingdom became a multicultural blend of Western and Greek culture, and despite being officially Catholic, the local Orthodox Christian Greeks were given cultural autonomy, and the Greek language was still used for all documents. This tolerance resulted in the Western reign over Cyprus being largely peaceful, but since the Muslim Turks had finally defeated the Greek Empire, this would change very soon. In 1570, the Turkish Ottoman Empire launched a full-scale invasion of Cyprus, and despite fierce Greek resistance, the Greeks were eventually defeated by the 60,000 men strong invasion force who committed numerous massacres against the island's Greek and Armenian populations. One example that perfectly encapsulates just how brutal and inhumane the medieval jihadists were against the native Christians is the tragic story of Marco Antonio Bragandin. During the invasion of Cyprus, Cyprus was ruled by the Venetians and the man who was put in charge of the defense of the important city of Famagusta was Bragadin, a Venetian lawyer and military officer. Under Bragadin's command, the city of Famagusta put up a heroic defense against the far more numerous barbaric invaders who outnumbered the Christians 10 to 1. But after four months, the walls of Famagusta were collapsing and the supplies were running out, so Bragadin began negotiations with the Turkish invaders. Bragadin managed to negotiate a surrender which allowed for all of the town's population to be spared. For four days, the evacuation of the town proceeded smoothly, but during the official surrender ceremony, the Turks betrayed Bragadin. First, the Turks captured Bragadin, whose nose and ears they cut off, and then after Afterwards, the Turkish Muslims began brutally massacring all of Famagusta's remaining Christians without a shed of honor nor dignity. Bragadin was left in a jail cell for two weeks. Afterwards, he was forced to walk around the walls of Famagusta with sacks of stone on his back. Next, he was tied to a chair and hoisted to the yard arm of the Turkish flagship, where he could be harassed by the Turkish sailors. And then, finally, he was taken to his place of execution in the main square. Here, the heroic Bragadin was tied naked to a column and skinned alive. Bragadin's quartered body was then distributed as a war trophy among the Muslim army, and his skin was stuffed and paraded around the streets of Famagusta in a deplorable attempt to mock Marco Antonio Bragandin and Famagusta's native population. Bragadin's skin was later stolen, or rather recovered, from Constantinopolis' arsenal in 1580 by the young Venetian seaman Girolamo Polidori. He brought it back to Venice, where it was received as a returning hero. This is just one example of how criminal and horrific the Turkish invaders acted against the Christians of Cyprus, but that hasn't stopped modern Turkish nationalists and Islamists from glorifying these inhumane acts. In 1954, an old cathedral which was vandalized under the Turks and turned into a mosque was renamed the Lala Mustafa Pasha Mosque in honor of Lala Mustafa Pasha, who was the commander that tortured and murdered Bragadin and massacred the Christian population. But while statues are coming down all across the West, this stolen cathedral still bears the name of its violator without a single outcry from the Western social justice movement. Imagine how horrible this occupation must have felt and still feels for the Cypriot people. First, the Greeks now had to survive massacres and over 300 years of Ottoman Islamist rule, where even their court testimony was ineligible in cases against the Turkish colonizers, among all the other previously mentioned demi-rules. And then 
after having endured all of this, they are still forced to be reminded of this period every single day by having a stolen cathedral being named after Lala Mustafa Pasha, one of the main culprits of these immoral acts. Hey, quickly, if you like how this video is made and you yourself is interested in having me edit your videos, I would more than love to do that. Just reach out to me on Instagram or Telegram. And secondly, if you wish to support this project in telling stories that no one else is talking about and exposing hypocrisies that the media isn't covering because it doesn't align with their own narrative, then consider supporting Postenebras on Patreon. It doesn't have to be for more than three dollars a month and with that you will be participating in making more videos from Postenebros possible. The link to Patreon is in the description. After having conquered Cyprus, the Turkish conquerors also did something that no other ruler had done by colonizing the island with 30,000 foreign Muslim settlers, including the Turkish troops that had just committed massacres against the native population. This new Turkish colonial population then over the years intermixed with Greeks who had converted to Islam as a way to circumvent the discriminatory policies used against them by the Turkish authorities. And this mixed Muslim population became known as the Turkish Cypriots, a group of people that ruled over the still majority Greek island. So let's quickly summarize. A foreign power that originally stems from Central Asia brutally conquered the Greek-speaking world including Cyprus and then colonized the island with Turkish speakers while oppressing the native population. And if you're wondering why you have never heard about this unmentioned historical reality while you can't avoid hearing about plenty of other similar tragedies, then don't worry, I will get to that. During the 1800s, the Ottoman Empire was already following in its late nemesis the Byzantine Empire's footsteps. In other words, it was corrupt and in steady decline, but the Ottoman Caliph knew this and was therefore so desperately trying to halt this decline that he in 1878, after having lost large parts of the Balkans to a Russian-led Orthodox alliance, made a secret agreement with Britain which leased the entire island of Cyprus in exchange for British protection from the Russians. While the now de facto British island officially remained part of the Ottoman Empire, this agreement called the Cyprus Convention in reality marked the end of the oppressive Ottoman Turkish rule over the Greek island. The official end to Ottoman rule over Cyprus would however come shortly thereafter in 1914 when the Ottoman Empire joined Britain's rivals Germany and Austria in World War I which then resulted in Britain officially annexing Cyprus into the British Empire since it made little sense to honor the Cyprus Convention when the Ottoman Empire was their enemy while the Russian Empire was suddenly Britain's ally. One year later, in 1915, when World War I was still raging, the British Empire interestingly offered Greece the entirety of Cyprus if Greece joined the war on Britain's side. But the Greek king, Constantine I, refused and stayed neutral, likely because the king had sympathies with Germany, where he himself had spent much of his youth and even served in the German Imperial Guard. This decision would however prove a fatal mistake since a theoretical Greek annexation of Cyprus in 1915 would have given Greece control over an important and strategic part of the Greek speaking world and also prevented the Turkish colonization of Cyprus in 1974. But alas, this did not happen and instead Cyprus remained a British colony, however a very troubled one at that. During the 1920s, the fires of nationalism were rising everywhere in the world and Cyprus was no exception. Here the Christian Greeks, who still made up over 80% of Cyprus's population, wished to rid themselves of their British colonial oppressors once and for all by finally unifying with their corresponding nation-state, the Kingdom of Greece, that itself had won a war of independence against the Turkish Empire a century earlier. This Greek Cypriot wish for unification with their motherland is normally called enosis, meaning union, and according to a referendum done by the Orthodox Greek Church of Cyprus in 1950, around 96% of Greek Cypriots was in favor of reunification with Greece, in other words, enosis. During the 1930s, tensions between the British authorities and the Greeks culminated in 5,000 Greek protesters setting fire to the British government house during the so-called October events in 1931. This act of open defiance was met with a severe reaction from the British governor of Cyprus, Richard Palmer, who turned Cyprus into an authoritarian state and further aligned himself with the Turkish Cypriot minority that the British were already on friendly terms with since both groups viewed the Greek anti 
anti-imperialist fighters as the enemy. During the authoritarian rule of Richard Palmer called the Palmerocracy, the entire Greek unification cause was completely banned from public discourse, even going as far as to ban the Greek flag from being displayed, despite the flag representing over 80% of the population, while the Union Jack represented barely anyone. But fed up with not only this new era of oppression, but also with centuries of foreign oppression, some Greek Cypriots decided to take matters into their own hands and launch a guerrilla war against their British former liberators, who now turned out to be nothing more than another foreign colonial power, not interested in justice or even in their own fellow Christians, but instead only in lining the pockets of their elite while using the rest of the world as expendable pawns. The armed guerrilla organization that the Greek Cypriots formed was named the National Organization of Cypriot Fighters, or EOKA for short, and its stated purpose was to put an end to the British rule and eventually unite Cyprus and Greece. EOKA's first attacks were in March 1955, and the attacks were exclusively aimed at British government targets and whoever it viewed as Greek collaborators, while attacks on Turkish Cypriot targets were for now prohibited, since EOKA did not wish to anger the Turkish government, because Turkey still hosted a sizable Greek minority. This gesture was however sadly fruitless, since unfounded hysteria about the situation in Cyprus started spreading in Turkey, which prompted the Turkish government to seize the moment and orchestrate a pogrom against Istanbul, aka Constantinopolis' founders, the native Greek population. The Turkish government bust in hordes of Turkish nationalists into Istanbul's Greek neighborhoods who in direct collaboration with an American-sponsored paramilitary group named Counter Guerrilla killed around 37 Greeks and sexually violated more than 400 women and boys. The way the Turkish mob knew whether or not their potential victims were Christians was according to an eyewitness witness testimony very easy, the mob would say, quote, pull it out and let us see. The poor man would then peel off his trousers and show his Muslimness and Turkishness, in other words, if he had been circumcised. If the man was circumcised, he would be left alone. If not, he was doomed. The very lucky victims were only beaten, but in some cases, the aggressive young men would draw their knives and circumcise the Greeks on the spot in the middle of the street. After this pogrom, the Turkish government took its actions one step further by making the pogrom the beginning of a genocide by thereafter introducing policies that would make the country's Greek population who had lived there for 2,000 years go from consisting of around 100,000 individuals in 1955 to only 48,000 individuals in 1965 with only 2,500 Greeks being left in Turkey today. Naturally, we will never hear anything about this very recent tragedy either, but don't worry, I will explain why a little later. In Cyprus, the British response to EOKA's actions was also harsh. The British introduced the death penalty for non-fatality related crimes and also purposefully tried to widen the divide between the country's Turkish and Greek communities by allowing the Turks to dominate the police force with four out of five police officers being from the relatively small Turkish minority. These British and Turkish measures, however, did not deter the EOKA, but instead only further fanned the flames of conflict between the Christians and the Muslims and made the guerrilla war more brutal. This increased brutality, for example, came in the shape of Eoka's decision to in 1957 start targeting Turkish Cypriot targets and vice versa, the Turkish Cypriot militia, the TMT, also started attacking Greek Cypriots, thus making both communities flee from mixed areas where they felt vulnerable and instead segregate into mono-ethnic communities who would view each other as enemies, something that would again only make the upcoming events even more inevitable. But wait, let's just understand who the TMT was versus the EOKA. The TMT was a Turkish Cypriot paramilitary group who almost wanted the exact same thing as the EOKA wanted, but just for Turks instead of for Greeks, with the only noticeable difference being that the Turks only wanted part of the island to be annexed by their own motherland instead of the whole country, since Turks were still only 18% of the island's population. This Turkish political goal was called Taksim, meaning division, so while the Greeks had Enosis, the Turks had Taksim. Due to the continued British failure to suppress the Eoka, London saw the writing on the wall and decided to try to find a solution to the whole catastrophe, which would not end in these two things. Firstly, 
Britain being embarrassed. Secondly, a war between Greece and Turkey over Cyprus. This would be an absolute catastrophe since the West in 1958 was in the middle of the Cold War and both Greece and especially Turkey were vital NATO countries who could quickly become a huge liability and make NATO look weak if they were to fight a war against each other since this could potentially massively benefit the Soviets, something which NATO wanted to avoid at all costs. Therefore, Britain, Turkey and Greece in 1959 came to a compromise known as the London and Zurich Agreements which in 1960 made Cyprus a nominally independent state for the first time in around 500 years. But this agreement left many people dissatisfied since the constitution was more of an incredibly convoluted compromise than a legitimate constitution. The so-called constitution awarded Britain a large piece of Cyprus which is still controlled by Britain till this day and also gave Turkey the right to veto important decisions. Yes, the Turkish government that had perpetrated countless genocides against the Greek people now had the right to veto important Cypriot government decisions. The agreement was also disappointing for the Greeks for the following reasons. Although 80% of the island's population were Greek Cypriots and these indigenous people had lived on the island for thousands of years and paid 94% of taxes. The new constitution gave the Turks, who only made up 17% of the population and paid 6% of the taxes, around 30% of government jobs and 40% of national security jobs. Therefore, many Greeks felt as if they were still being ruled by Turkey, while many Turkish Cypriots were more satisfied with the situation. Since they had a disproportionate amount of influence. And all in all, the Greeks were still oppressed by foreign powers from far away lands since the agreement was stopping them from reuniting with their homeland. And as we can see throughout history, most Greek populations that did not unite with Greece after the fall of the Ottoman Empire have been expelled from their homelands, like in Smyrna, now called Izmir, Constantinopolis, now called Istanbul, and many, many more such places all across Anatolia. And all of this was done by Turkey, a nation that was given the right to intervene militarily in Cyprus, according to the London and Syriac agreements, a right that it would very soon use to expel the native Greeks from yet another piece of ancestral land. The Turkish Cypriot side also refused to integrate their municipalities into mixed municipalities since they feared a backlash from the Greek majority, but this also further increased tensions. And finally, the TMT and EOKA were also both angered by the treaty since they both viewed the treaty as a setback since it forbade the island from joining either Turkey nor Greece. All these sad factors resulted in Makarios III, the Greek Cypriot president, in 1963 proposing to amend the constitution just three years after Cyprus achieved its statehood. The proposed constitution had the majority of the population support but was sadly vetoed by Turkey and the Turkish Cypriots since they did not wish to lose their privileged status and move further towards Enosis since Makarios had stated that this would be his final goal when it would be possible. The tensions only further continued to rise throughout the rest of 1963 until they culminated on the 21st of December when the intercommunal violence again exploded into all-out warfare between the Turks and the Greeks resulting in 364 dead Turks and 174 dead Greeks and up to 25,000 Turkish Cypriots fled from their home into Turkish Cypriot enclaves. Using this increase in violence as an excuse, the Turkish army that had been allowed to have a garrison on the island as a part of the London and Zurich agreements took control over one of the island's most important roads that leads to Nicosia, the country's capital. After having taken control over the important road, the Turkish army permanently banned all Greeks from using it, unless accompanied by a UN convoy. Turkey also increased the stakes even further by now also threatening to invade Cyprus, only being stopped by the American president Lyndon B. Johnson warning Turkey that if such an attack occurred, then America might not defend Turkey in case of a Soviet invasion. 
But despite this seemingly pro-Greek move, America and Britain were in reality more pragmatically pro-Turkish than anything else since both countries were paving the way for their own Turkish invasion of Cyprus behind the scenes. You see, the CIA had long been on Cyprus trying to strengthen NATO's position there while making sure that any pro-Soviet forces became either dead or irrelevant. And since the Greek Cypriot president Makarios had some latent pro-Eastern sympathies, the CIA and Britain had created an emergency plan that would allow for Turkey to invade and expel the Greeks from around half the island if that could possibly prevent a pro-Soviet takeover. And at the end of the day, Turkey was was and still is simply just more of a strategic partner than the much less powerful nation of Greece is. And therefore, America and Britain are willing to overlook Turkey's frequent pogroms against Anatolia's indigenous population if that means that Turkey will continue to support NATO. And this is by no means surprising considering that America is still funding extremist groups around the world and is currently dropping around 46 bombs a day on other countries, many of them hitting impoverished children who have never even heard of Joe Biden or Donald Trump. The situation remained the same between 1964 and 1966, with the government favoring Enosis while the Turks were increasingly trying to separate themselves and prepare for an eventual conflict. But this would change in 1967 when Greece's government was overthrown by a military junta. This new dictatorial government was viewed with huge amounts of skepticism by Makarios, who was sympathetic towards socialism. Therefore, Makarios decided to change his entire political platform from being pro-Enosis to being pro-Cypriot independence, at least until Greece would return to its more democratic system, a move that would anger not only the Greek dictatorship, but also many Greek nationalists in Cyprus, including the remnants of Eoka, now called Eoka B, who together with the dictatorship would try to assassinate Makarios, not one not twice, but four times, all of them without luck. However, on the 15th of July 1974, everything would change when the conflict between Makarios and the Greek nationalists culminated in Eoka B together with the Greek military government overthrowing Makarios and proclaiming the Hellenic Republic of Cyprus, whose new government would quickly start cracking down on dissidents. The head of this new government was the Eoka B member Nikos Samson and he announced that the intention of the government of the Hellenic Republic of Cyprus was to continue with Enosis, thereby finally being incorporated into their long lost motherland, Greece. But this was an incredibly risky maneuver. On one hand, being successfully incorporated into Greece would free Cyprus from its Turkish and British hegemony once and for all, with the Greeks finally being able to live in peace with their families without ever having to worry about being the victims of yet another Turkish ultranationalist pogrom. But on the other hand, going forward with Enosis would exponentially increase the chances of a Turkish invasion here and now, a fight that the Cypriot Greeks would most likely lose, since the the Turkish army was better equipped and because Cyprus was far away from mainland Greece, which would make it difficult for the Greeks to reinforce Cyprus in time. It was a genuine possibility that by the time Greek reinforcements would have arrived to Cyprus, the Turks would have likely already taken control over the island and started oppressing the Greeks yet again. However, according to the Greek dictator at the time, Dimitrios Ioannidis, the United States had promised that they would prevent any Turkish invasion since removing the supposedly pro-Soviet Makarios was also in their interest. But no matter what the risks were, there was no going back now for Nikos Sam and the Greek government, the die had been cast, and no matter what the outcome would be, everyone knew that the next couple of days would determine the fate of Cyprus. And a couple of days after the coup, the foreseeable happened. Turkey first demanded a return to pre-coup arrangements, but after the new government refused this demand, the Turks began an invasion, citing Article 4 of the Treaty of Guarantee that allows for Greece, Britain or Turkey to use military force with the purpose of re-establishing the state of affairs created by the London and Zurich agreements, which the Greek military coup in Cyprus certainly broke. 
But it would soon become apparent that Turkey had far more sinister plans in mind than simply returning to the status quo, thus making their reason for this so-called military operation completely illegitimate. The Turkish invasion of Cyprus commenced on the 20th of July 1974, just five days after the coup. But the initial invasion force wouldn't make much progress, only succeeding in taking 3% of Cypriot territory and paying a heavy price for every single percentage, with an entire Turkish airborne company being wiped out. And on top of that, the Greek Cypriots had also succeeded in taking several major Turkish Cypriot enclaves and the ones that had not already been taken by the Greeks were under siege by the end of the 21st of July. However, more trouble was brewing in the place that the Greek Cypriots least wanted it. It was brewing on the Greek mainland, where the Greek leadership was getting cold feet. The Greek junta thought that the coup in Cyprus would have gone smoothly, without any Turkish invasion, since that is what they allegedly had had been promised by the Americans. Ioannidis is reported to have said angrily to the American minister, Joseph de Sisko, you betrayed us, you had assured us that you would prevent any Turkish landing. This potential for all-out war with Turkey wasn't anything that the already unstable Greek dictatorship was prepared for. Therefore, the rest of the junta overthrew Ioannidis and ended their involvement in Cyprus. Thereby, from one moment to another on the 23rd of July, just two days after the invasion had started, the Greek government had already sold out the Greek Cypriots to the Turks. Thus, on the 14th of August 1974, the Greek Cypriots, who had now been abandoned by the Greek government, were overrun, when a much larger and better equipped Turkish force launched an effective attack that managed to capture the northern half of Cyprus. And while this Greek defeat marked the end of all-out warfare between the Turks and the Greek Cypriots, what happened next would reveal Turkey's true motives and its ultra-nationalist government's incredible hypocrisy. Because instead of trying to re-establish the status quo like Turkey had promised, the Turkish government would instead embark on an almost universally condemned campaign of ethnic cleansing against the indigenous Greek population from all of northern Cyprus, a place that the Greeks had called home for thousands of years, but now they were being kicked out by Turkish troops who had never even set foot on the island before. Up to 250,000 Greeks were expelled from their homes in northern Cyprus by the Turkish invaders, simply just for the crime of being Christians who spoke Greek, and as if that wasn't enough, the Turkish soldiers would also frequently force themselves upon young Christian women, allegedly in an attempt to soften resistance. This became so normal that the conservative Cypriot Orthodox Church pragmatically allowed for abortions to be performed simply because of the quantity of these crimes committed by Turkish soldiers, and these horrific ordeals that the average Christian Cypriot was now being subjected to was exactly what the Greeks all this time had feared would happen if they did not join the nation-state of Greece. These blatant human rights violations did naturally result in Turkey being found guilty of displacement of persons, deprivation of liberty, ill-treatment, deprivation of life, and deprivation of possessions by the European Commission of Human Rights. But the Turks were never faced with any concrete consequences, since Turkey was just too important of an ally for the West to risk alienating the Turks. So while the Serbs were not allowed to intervene to protect ethnic Serbs during the breakup of Yugoslavia without being bombed by NATO, the Turks, on the other hand, were allowed to sail across an entire ocean and expel the Greek population of Cyprus from what amounts to 37% of the island without as much as a single threat of NATO military action. And it also just so happens that those 37% of the island that Turkey seized is also worth 70% of Cyprus's GDP, was at the time. After having taken control over northern Cyprus, around 50,000 Turkish Cypriots fled to there and Turkey then in 1975 proclaimed the Turkish Federated State of Cyprus. But since this had nothing to do with re-establishing the status quo either, this Turkish action was also condemned by the international community. 
For example, by the United Nations Security Council, who in Resolution 367 expressed deep regret at the formation of this illegal Turkish-made puppet state within the Republic of Cyprus. This Turkish puppet state later in 1983 dropped any pretense of still being a part of the Republic of Cyprus and issued a declaration proclaiming itself the Republic of Northern Cyprus, which has to this day only ever been recognized by one single country, Turkey. Everyone else in the international community just views it as an illegal Turkish colony on Cypriot land. But what did Turkey, who had up until this point merely claimed to be acting in the defense of Turkish Cypriots, actually do when they finally achieved power in northern Cyprus? Well, again, the Turkish government firstly expelled the island's native population from much of the island, leaving only 340 free Greeks left on the northern half of the island. And these remaining Greeks are under constant attack by the discriminatory Turkish Cypriot authorities who are constantly trying to suppress the last holdouts of the island's native identity. A blatant example of this from 1994 is the following. When Eleni Foka, one of the few Greek teachers still teaching in northern Cyprus, complained about feeling threatened, she was almost expelled simply for voicing her fear for her own and her colleagues' safety. Under Turkish rule, the beautiful and ancient Greek cultural heritage of Cyprus that once made the island a center of Hellenic culture has been completely decimated and defiled beyond repair. Archaeological sites, museums, churches, monasteries, castles, libraries, and private art collections have all become the victims of Turkish nationalists, who have stripped them of Greek Byzantine icons, frescoes, archaeological artifacts, and cultural heritage in an attempt to Turkify the island by erasing any evidence of its former inhabitants. This constitutes further and unquestionable proof that the Turkish plan for the island of Cyprus is designed to be irreversible. And it's not only the Christian community that has become the victims of this cultural erasure, so has the island's Jewish population. The historic Jewish cemetery in Marco, which is a national monument for the Jewish people, has for example also been destroyed by the Turkish nationalists, who until this day are not allowing for free access to the cemetery. This looting is also big business since one illegal sale that was intercepted was being sold to an American museum for $20 million. In total, this has been one of the most systematic examples of the looting of art since World War II. And even if you aren't Greek, this should concern you because damage to cultural heritage belonging to any people whatsoever means damage to the cultural heritage of all of mankind. Finally, the Turkish government has also purposefully and brazenly colonized northern Cyprus with around 250,000 settlers from the Turkish mainland, who now make up half of the population of northern Cyprus. These people are complete outsiders with no connection to Cyprus whatsoever who have with the Turkish government's permission illegally taken over the homes of expelled Greeks who lost everything when the Turkish army kicked them out of their homes. So while these colonialists are now sleeping in the natives' bedrooms, the natives have in many cases been sent into poverty. These Turkish settlers serve free goals. Firstly, the settlers are a much needed population boost. Since the north lost the majority of its workers when the Turkish army expelled the Greeks, and as one might have guessed, expelling an entire region's population usually doesn't benefit the region's economy. Secondly, the Turkish settlers are Turkifying northern Cyprus, which will result in Turkey becoming more influential in the eastern Mediterranean, a very strategic region that includes both Syria, Cyprus, and Israel, among several other states. And now Turkey can have more influence here, since it now now has an entire population center right in the middle of it. Thirdly, the colonists are also making any possible reintegration of northern Cyprus into the rest of Cyprus completely impossible since the Greeks under no circumstances want half of their own country to suddenly be made up of the same Turkish colonists who took over the homes of their parents and grandparents. So for these free reasons, Turkey has decided to ignore international law and instead allow for its own citizens to occupy the homes of the native people of Cyprus, an extremely hypocritical act considering how the Turkish President Erdogan is constantly attacking Israel for its own colonial settlements. But when Turkey itself is doing it, it's of course completely fine. 
In fact, by colonizing Cyprus, Turkey is violating the Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits an occupying power from willfully transferring its own population to the occupied area, something which is a blatant war crime and Turkey is fully aware about how hypocritical and illegal its actions are against Cyprus and has therefore done everything in its power to make it seem as if the amount of Turkish settlers is much smaller than it really is. One way that Turkey has hidden its violations of the Geneva Convention is by simply falsifying the birth certificates of its settlers to make it appear as if they they are merely Turkish Cypriots returning to Cyprus, while in reality, the settlers are usually poor people from Turkey. However, this attempt at hiding the Turkish state's sinister operations did not work as can be seen by the many UN condemnations of its illegal colonial policies, but the Turkish state's policies have not only caused problems for the Greeks, but also for the Turkish Cypriots, who report that they themselves also feel colonized by Turkey in a way that they never wanted to be because Turkish Cypriots are very different in terms of culture and values than the Turkish settlers generally are. Turkish Cypriots are for example generally far more secular than the usually religious Turkish settlers. This has created tensions between the two parties since some Turkish Cypriots feel as if Sharia law is being imposed upon them by outsiders. Many Turkish Cypriots also still feel close to the culture of the Greek Cypriots and are far more willing to work towards reunification with the Greek side, while the Turkish settlers are generally fiercely in favor of Taksim and the integration of northern Cyprus into Turkey. In fact, Turkish Cypriots are rather closely related to the Greek natives, since much of their population admixture comes from Greek Cypriots, who simply converted to Islam and slowly started speaking Turkish, like for example the Lino Bambaki, a large group of Catholics who for hundreds of years pretended to be Muslims before finally converting into the Turkish Cypriot population around 150 years ago. So for these last two parts, I really wanted to do it face to face with you guys and you'll probably understand why in a little bit. So in total, what would be the best solution to the current Cyprus issue? Well, in my opinion, it would certainly seem like the best solution to the current stalemate would be to reintegrate Northern Cyprus into the Republic of Cyprus but without the Turkish settler population that would instead be resettled in their homeland Turkey, which is certainly the only way that many Greek victims of the colonialist Turkish policies can move back into their stolen homes. This solution is completely in line with the official position of all parties except for Turkey and the Turkish nationalists in Northern Cyprus. However, after this happens, the people of Cyprus should naturally be able to finally reunite with their motherland Greece, something that the Turkish Cypriots wouldn't have to fear, considering that Greece already has a large Muslim minority in Western Thrace, which is completely protected by the Greek state, while Turkey has completely failed at protecting its own indigenous minorities. So let's recap. The Turkish Ottoman Empire first invaded and subjugated the Christian Cypriot Greeks and thereafter colonized them. After this, the Greeks had to live under discriminatory Turkish rule for 300 years. The Greeks then had to fight against the British Empire that still occupies parts of Cyprus until this day. And finally, the native Greek population was expelled from half of the island by the Turkish government, who instead colonized the north with its own colonists. An obvious violation of the Geneva Convention, a war crime, and last but not least, also a crime against humanity. Turkey is now also illegally occupying EU territory since Cyprus is now also an EU member state. But despite this, the EU continues to treat Turkey with the utmost care. But now that we understand the sheer scale and extreme severity of this event, one giant question presents itself. Why don't we ever hear about this frozen conflict within the borders of the European Union? Where are the usual suspects who always claim to stand up for the oppressed, no matter the odds or the opponent? Where are the liberals that stand up for the rights of migrants and sexual minorities? Where are the leftists that claim to stand up for the oppressed nations of the world? Where are the pro-American and patriotic Westerners who will defend countries that they first heard about yesterday until their last breath? Where are the celebrities? And finally, where are the Islamic identitarians who constantly spread awareness regarding Israel's behavior against the Palestinian people on the West Bank. 
Let's start with the Islamists. Where are the millennial internet Islamists that usually seem to be in love with calling out the Chinese government for their treatment of the Uyghurs or starting new social media campaigns against the Israeli government for their treatment of the Palestinians? Where is Qatari Al Jazeera's concern for the oppressed Greeks of Cyprus, who like Palestinians were also forced from their homes? Well, the answer to where these people are is very simple. These people simply don't care about Greeks because Greeks are Christians instead of Muslims. When it's Christians being oppressed by Muslims, this segment that usually screams about injustice suddenly becomes either suspiciously quiet or in fact starts glorifying the oppressors. The greatest contemporary example of this is the Turkish president and would-be Ottoman Sultan Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who is constantly talking about Israeli oppression while he himself is the leader of a state that is currently engaged in colonizing Cyprus with settlers who are moving into the homes of the indigenous people that his country has displaced. Another example is TRT, Erdogan's propaganda channel, who is amplifying this message about Muslims being oppressed around the world while ignoring the incredibly racist acts that Turkey is currently engaged in against Christian Greeks who have lived in Cyprus for thousands of years before anyone even heard about a country called Turkey. When one looks at this hypocrisy, the true worldview of Islamists become very clear. Whenever Muslims rule over Christians, they are glorious mujahideen, expanding their mighty empire and deen. But every time Muslims are ruled over by any other religion, the Muslims are an oppressed minority. So therefore, it is very obvious that the Islamists would never care for any unbelieving Kafir Greek. But by revealing their selective outrage, they also make their entire narrative impossibly to take serious. This type of double standard, however, isn't anything unique to Islamists. It can also be found in many other ideologies, maybe even your own. Next up, where are the American-style liberals when it comes to Cyprus? After all, this is a group of people who is usually vocal when it comes to standing up for the rights of immigrants, sexual minorities, and indigenous people. And while it might at first seem confusing why Western liberals never talk about Cyprus, the reason why is rather easy to explain. It is because the very real reality of Muslims oppressing Christian Europeans goes directly against the narrative that they have been propagating for the last 40 years through educational institutions and the media, which claims that Europeans have been significantly more evil through human history than any other group. A claim that would quickly collapse the second that the average Westerner would hear about the absolute horrors like mass enslavement that the Ottoman Empire and other Islamic empires committed against Europeans on European soil until very recently. Ask yourself, when have you ever heard any self-proclaimed leftist or liberal talk about Cyprus? Never. The same group of people will naturally talk endlessly about the horrible things done by Europeans much further back in time, but an incredibly recent and blatant example of state-sponsored racism, imperialism, violations of the Geneva Convention, and colonialism right on their own doorstep is ignored simply because it doesn't fit into their narrative. So therefore, you will never hear the liberals and their institutions report on Cyprus on social media, and thus the average person remains unaware about this huge crime against humanity. But by ignoring this and many other such examples of horrific things, this group is revealing their true motives, which certainly isn't an egalitarian world. And lastly, where are the Western conservatives? The NATO types and the generic Western conservatives love to claim to be staunch defenders of Christian Europe and Western civilization, but in fact, this group also benefits from the Turkish invasion of Cyprus remaining forgotten. The reason why the conservatives benefit from this is because they firstly need their alliance with Turkey strong and any development or increased pressure on Turkey to halt its colonization of Cyprus could jeopardize this very important geopolitical objective. Secondly, it is also because the West has also participated in the oppression of Cyprus despite it being a Christian and European nation. But wait, why would the so-called defenders of Christian civilization do something like that to European Christians? Well, the answer to that question is very simple, because Western conservatives never have had the well-being of Christians at heart. Instead, all they care about is more power and enriching themselves while tricking young men into sacrificing their own lives for a false cause. Just look at Syria, where Western conservatives supported jihadists who wished to overthrow a government who protected its Christians, or Iraq, where the American War of Aggression completely devastated the ancient Christian population of Iraq, whose numbers had remained stable under Saddam's dictatorship. 
These are just some of many examples of how Western conservatives have participated in the destruction of what they claim to worship. But in reality, the only thing that the capitalist conservatives worship is money. So, because it doesn't benefit any of these political groups, we will never hear about this ongoing crime against the native people of Cyprus and against the territorial integrity of the European Union. It doesn't matter that this colonization is both breaking European law and the Geneva Convention right here, right now, because at the end of the day, it's a conflict that both the West and Turkey prefers having swept under the rug, since it could easily make the alliance between these countries falter if brought up. And while Greece frequently brings attention to this huge issue, Greece is under no circumstances a particularly influential nation nowadays since most of its territory was annexed by Turkey. So therefore, the Greek voices speaking up for their own people in Cyprus are ignored. So, therefore, none of these groups ever bring attention to this situation or, for good measure, a plethora of other conflicts around the world, like, for example, Yemen. Because bringing attention to a political cause requires a huge amount of resources, media attention, and also potentially burns a lot of bridges with different factions throughout the world. Therefore, the average person will only ever be aware of a select number of causes since the country's ruling class needs the average person's consent and support to start new conflicts or reduce that person's standard of living. And since that isn't the case with regards to the absolutely tragic situation in Cyprus, barely anyone else will ever mention this story and the real losers are all of us who won't be able to live in a peaceful world and in this case especially the Greeks and anti-imperialist Turkish Cypriots since the conflict just simply isn't worth currently resolving according to the people in power. Finally, I wish to add that naturally the violence in this conflict wasn't only one-sided. Many Turkish Cypriots also suffered greatly during the intercommunal violence, which of course was also incredibly tragic. Thank you so much for watching the video. Here are the different ways that you can help this video gain traction. First, like the video. Secondly, give it a nice comment. Thirdly, share the videos on forums, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, the absolutely only way that Post Tenebras can continue is if you support it on Patreon, since this is what the vast majority of my time gets spent on, and therefore it won't be possible to make these videos without your support. On Patreon, you can support Post Tenebras with as little as $3 a month, or any larger amount as well. If you support Post Tenebras on Patreon, you are not only making the continuation of Post Tenebras possible, you will also receive a lot of early access footage and behind the scenes stuff. And naturally, you will also be given a shout out at the end of every video for your amazing help. The link to Patreon can be found in the video's description. The current patrons who are making these videos possible are Justin, Enrico, Alexander, Luke, Laurentius, Milan, Joda, Jean, and William. Thank you all.